Hello and good evening. It's Nicole Scheidel here with CPL's The Pulse. And today we're talking to Dr. Thomas Bouchard. Uh, Dr. Bouchard um, did his undergraduate studies at McGill University and after that spent three years doing research on dementia in Parkinson's disease at the University of Alberta. He then completed medical school and residency at the University of Calgary and now practices general family medicine low risk obstetrics and is the medical director at two nursing homes in Calgary. He is also a clinical lecturer at the University of Calgary and sits on the perinatal palliative care committee. He's published over 40 articles on a wide variety of issues from natural family planning to Parkinson's disease. So Dr. Bouchard, I'm so grateful that you're here to speak with me tonight. Great, thanks for having me. So do you want to tell me a little bit about your work, particularly in the perinatal palliative care area, and why do people come to you? Sure. So this all started uh, when I was a young family doctor, when a patient of mine came to me with a, uh, a poor prognosis from an anatomic ultrasound, and we journeyed together um, related to this uh, baby that had severe hydrocephalus and what happened at her uh, delivery. And um, of course, she did not live for very long. So we had to do some palliative care with her with the, the team in the NICU. And it was a, a, a wonderful, even though that sounds ironic, it was a, a, a beautiful journey with the family. Uh, and they had six other children that we I journeyed with the whole family through that process prenatally and postnatally. Um, and so that started me down this path of creating a program in Calgary that's fairly unique in North America, where I uh, quarterback care for um, couples, families that have a diagnosis, prenatal diagnosis that suggests maybe the baby may not live for very long. So that program I started is called the Family Physician Navigator Program, and I help uh, families to deal with these um, prenatal diagnoses and help coordinate the care that they might be getting from specialists and talk about delivery plans. So if someone needs that program, how do they find out about it? Is it just word of mouth usually? Yeah, mostly word of mouth. And now uh, when, because the maternal fetal medicine uh, ultrasonographers know about the program, both for myself and from other patients, if they know uh, of a patient who is wanting that type of coordinated care, um, they'll get in touch with me. And uh, patients have also self-referred through friends to this program. So um, either through the MFM um, diagnosis at the anatomic ultrasound or through uh, friends or through the community that they'll find that um, the, that added care that I can provide and coordinate um, might be beneficial to them. So last week uh, at the um, Special Joint Committee on Euthanasia, which uh, I guess euf euphemistically is called medical aid in dying, but it certainly is further than that now. Uh, one of the doctors representing the Quebec College of Physicians and Surgeons um, said ki kind of, it seemed a little bit uh, nonchalant that he suggested Canadians should expand euthanasia criteria to include infants under one. And I just thought we would maybe play that clip of what he said, and then I'd like you to react to it, uh, given your experience from, um, you know, what, what you know as a doctor in caring for patients in that situation. So let's just bring it up here and we'll just let it play. Distant and intolerable suffering that they may experience. Oh, sorry, let me take it back to the beginning. Oh, there we go. Minors from 14 to 7 years of age and nearly 18. Um, the rec committee recommends and the board of directors supports as well that these minors could uh, with their tutors or parental parent could make a request for MAID based on the level of uh, persistent and intolerable suffering that they may experience and become unmanageable and senseless. The same for babies from zero to one years of age who are born with severe uh, deformations, very uh, grave and severe 
uh, syndromes, medical syndromes, whose life expectancy and uh, level of suffering are such that it would uh, make sense to ensure that they do not suffer, given that their possibility of surviving uh, is basically nil. And this is something that has been used in the Netherlands as an argument, and we could explore that option. So when you hear that, what, what, what is your reaction to that? I think the first thing is trying to think about the families who are receiving information about a poor prenatal prognosis. Um, the, in, in many cases where uh, families react to language used about their baby's conditions, they, they really do not like words like uh, a lethal anomaly or uh, fatal condition or even things that were used in this um, in Dr. Roy's uh, presentation there when he talks about uh, severe syndromes or severe deformations. Uh, he used the language of uh, the chance of survival is basically nil. The, that language is not appreciated by patients uh, and families. So what we would like to use for language instead is um, words like life limiting condition or um, the baby may not be able to live for very long um, but we don't know essentially in a lot of these conditions prognosis is not known and in about half of the cases that i've dealt with the babies are still alive and and don't have a poor prognosis anymore so i i think the reality is uh, we need to be humble enough to admit that we, we don't have all the answers. And in cases where we think there might be a poor prenatal diagnosis, um, sometimes babies surprise us when they come out. Um, sometimes they do live for a very short life. Um, but these are very beautiful lives. And there are certainly many ways that we can help uh, treat pain and to help these babies have very little suffering when they're born. So um, I, I think painting the picture of severe anomalies, severe syndromes, uh, survival basic, basically nil, and uh, this picture of suffering that is um, untreatable certainly gives such a dismal picture that it would be hard to find any family that would be accepting of that. So I think language matters a lot. Um, and I would say families don't appreciate language that paints such a dismal picture uh, when it could be presented otherwise. So I'm, I'm sure many of your patients would fall under the kind of umbrella or the way that he's presented this. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of your patients that you've dealt with where maybe the baby did surprise you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's one uh, baby who uh, was told that she would not survive and um, she is now alive at I think she's uh, five years old now. Um, and, you know, I won't give too many details of the case, but this is a situation where the uh, parents were both told that this baby were, would not survive um, and the baby is doing just fine, uh, you know, not not without challenges, of course, but every, every child presents challenges. But um, b basically, I think at the end of the day, um, we have to realize that, even with the best diagnostic tools, we don't have all the answers and we need to be able to, uh, once these babies are born, give them uh, a chance to prove themselves, right? For lack of a better term. And sometimes the babies are uh, uh, too weak and they can't survive because they're multiple comorbidities, but other times uh, they, they do have a fighting chance and surprise everybody and do survive longer term. So. Um, you know, we've had cases in, through the program of babies with anencephaly, trisomy 18, um, hydrocephalus, um, omphalocele's, you know, uh, lots of different situations. And each of them has a very unique prognosis and it can't be painted with broad strokes. And certainly the, the burden of suffering is not uniform right like we have to treat each patient individually each family individually and there are lots of solutions that we can provide to help these families uh, give the most compassionate care to these babies 
So just on that note, what means do we have practically to address suffering so that it's not really ever necessary to kill newborns or toddlers? Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, a few uh, things that I would mention just by way of example. The first uh, that can be very easily administered even to a baby that is going to, to pass away very shortly after birth, and that is intranasal fentanyl. And there are uh, many different protocols that have been developed uh, across North America to, to give very specific guidelines on how much intranasal fentanyl is going to provide adequate pain, pain control for these babies. So that is a, an amazing tool uh, that I think every, every NICU should be familiar with. Even, you know, obstetrics wards should be familiar with this too when babies are born and are going to live for a short while but still need some pain control. The second one, um, I think, is something that people may not always thinking of, think about, and that's called kangaroo care. And there's some new research looking at how kangaroo care can decrease pain scores in, in infants. Uh, they'll even suggest kangaroo care prior to uh, uh, blood draws for so that the blood draws are not painful. So kangaroo care is basically skin-on-skin -skin contact with the mother, um, and this provides dramatic decreases in um, both the mother and the baby as far as physiologic stress, um, their sense of pain. Um, so kangaroo care would be kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from a medication like intranasal fentanyl, but also provides very valuable comfort to that baby um, and is something that needs to be encouraged. And there's, there's studies ongoing uh, on the topic of kangaroo care that can really help in, in that process of perinatal palliative care. So what you, so if you have parents that come to you and they're afraid of their children's suffering, um, what do you say to alleviate that suffering? You've given us some examples, but just in terms of walking with their children and, and bringing them into part of the family dynamic, even if their lives are short, how does that, how is that different um, from maybe a family that, decides to end the life of their child immediately. I think being able to uh, allow the baby to direct the process in the sense that we, we want to not take control for ourselves, but instead let the baby determine what the next steps are for care. What I mean by that is it is possible in many cases with a, a poor prenatal prognosis that the baby dies in utero. Um, there's also a possibility that the baby dies shortly after birth. So we can't predict exactly when this baby, uh, how long the baby's life will be. So the first thing that needs to happen is uh, an acceptance on the part of the parents to say, um, there's some unpredictability here that we want to prepare our hearts for. And part of the role of somebody like me who wants to be involved in these cases is um, being able to talk about these and give space for the, the kind of the emotion, the reactions, uh, so that um, you could say that the grieving process could get started prenatally. Because if it gets started prenatally, it's, it's definitely much less severe when the baby is born because they're ready, they've prepared themselves for it. If things are terminated early, it doesn't give space for that grieving process to happen in a normal, natural way. So I think the, the biggest advantage of these babies giving, given the opportunity to live as long as they are given to live is the opportunity for the family to grow into that, to accept it and to grieve that process. And that grieving still needs to happen even if the baby lives a longer time because this is a hard experience for the family. And if, if we can get them to start experiencing the difficulties, then they can suffer with, this is what compassion is, to suffer with their baby together in, in a family atmosphere rather than it being something that is forced or something that is um, truncated or terminated early. Um, that's not a process that is easy to grieve. Whereas if you allow this natural process to happen, the grieving is going to be um, much more um, of an easier process, even though it's never easy. It's just going to be, um, it's just going to allow the, 
all of the feelings, the experiences, the emotions to be felt in due time rather than in a rushed fashion. So your patients that you've worked with who've gone through this process, what would they say was beneficial to their family for sort of working through it with you? I think uh, a big thing is looking at the whole person and the, the whole family. So the whole person meaning, um, do they need additional supports in certain areas as far as mood, how their mental health is? Do they need additional supports as far as um, work supports? You know, maybe they need time off of work. Um, that includes maybe uh, one of the spouses uh, needing an extended parental leave, for example. Do they need spiritual care? So a lot of times will involve chaplains or uh, if they come from a certain faith background, involve the, the leader of their faith tradition uh, to be involved in the process. So spiritual care is often a big part of it. Um, uh, there's often other kind of social aspects of the family's care that are important. So involving the children, making sure that the children can be helped to understood at their age level what's happening. So I often will facilitate that because the parents don't always know what to say. So I try to find words that will um, be understandable even to the youngest children in the family so that they know what's happening with their little baby brother or sister. So for me, it's facilitating that family experience that focuses on the whole person uh, and that doesn't medicalize the experience, but allows it to be something that is patient and family centered. So if you had the opportunity to testify before the same committee that Dr. Roy testified before, what would you want the decision makers there to know? I would say that we need to have a profound humility in the face of life and death and illness and how people can handle illness. And it always surprises me what people can carry. You know, it, it, there, there seems to be um, an unending human capacity to um, basically shoulder things when they have the right supports. And I, I think as a, as a community, we need to support people to give everybody their best chance at life. And that usually means the patient is the one to say, you know, you know, let, let me, let me try the best I can with adequate medical supports and social and family supports to live. And so if we do that with all of our adult citizens that are living with us today, we should also do that with our prenatal citizens, our babies that are just born. We should give them the best chance at life. And I think we have to allow them to guide the care. What does it mean to allow a baby to guide the care? It means that if they look like they are vigorous enough to tolerate certain interventions, like being intubated, for example, we attempt that. And if they tolerate that well, then we can continue down that road. If it seems instead like they're weak and they're vulnerable and it would be too burdensome to accept a certain degree of care, then we allow them to be uh, comfortable and allow them to die uh, a, a natural, peaceful um, death in comfort, um, but that we don't dictate what that looks like, that we allow the patient, in this case, a newborn baby, to tell us what they need, um, to, and, and what, they, what they may not accept. And in some cases, that means that they, their little body can't accept the burden of some interventions that we might provide. So we allow them to direct the course of care rather than us uh, calling the shots from on high, having this sense of we know what's best rather than listening to this little baby patient to tell us what might be best for them. That's a beautiful sentiment on which to end this. I, I love that listening aspect. I think we could all benefit from that. So thank you so much for joining me tonight. Okay. Thanks, Nicole.